Hello everybody and welcome to today's FE and VET qualitative webinar. Uh, my name is Daniel King, I'm one of the senior project managers at Acorus, one of the delivery partners for the Turing scheme uh, and with me today is my colleague uh, Olivia Nola and we'll be going through today's webinar with you. Um, so we'll just move on. So this is the short agenda for today's webinar. Um, the main focus of today's session is to go over the Turing Scheme's qualitative assessment criteria and provide practical examples which can be applied by applicants when working on the form. Um, so just a quick overview of what we're going through. We'll start off by covering frequently asked questions that we've received to our helpline and from previous webinars. Um, we'll then go through each individual element of the assessment criteria and explain how it should be linked into the scheme's objectives and give examples where applicable. And then we'll finish up with an open forum Q&A session where you can ask any questions about the programme that you have. Um, please note that you're able to post questions using the Q&A function at the top of your screen and receive these questions throughout the presentation privately. But once we're able to answer them, uh, we'll publish them and then you'll be able to see responses. Um, yeah, so just don't repeatedly ask the same question thinking it hasn't gone through. We have seen it, we're just working on it. Um, yeah, so the session should last one hour, so it should be done at 12. OK, so we'll start off with the frequently asked questions. Um, number one, <clears throat> uh, the most common query to the Turing Helpline relates to eligibility to apply for funding. Uh, the Turing scheme has a very broad eligibility criteria and that includes any school or college that delivers FE or VET, any public body involved in FE or VET, any company involved in FE or VET and any organisation applying on behalf of an eligible consortium. One of the most common parts of an eligibility criteria uh, query that we see relates to the legal status of organisations. For example, whether a sole trader or a charity could apply. So we can just confirm that there's no legal status requirements to apply for this sector. However, all applicants are subject to a financial capacity check, which means certain types of organisation may struggle to secure funding. Um, the full details of financial capacity checks and what they involve can be found in the programme guide. Um, another important factor for project eligibility is participant eligibility. Um, and this essentially boils down to that so long as you can demonstrate that your participants fall into the defined eligibility criteria, you are likely to be able to apply for funding. Next up we have, um, we've had many queries relating to higher diplomas or foundation degrees and asking whether these should be FE and VET or HE. I can confirm that any qualifications that sits above level three in the national qualification framework and is therefore classed in the UK as HE must be applied under the HE sector of funding. There can be some variants uh, based in the constituent countries of the UK, so that's the broad guidelines, but if there's anything specific you want to clarify before applying, do contact the Turing helpline. Next up is accompanying persons. Accompanying persons are included in the Turing scheme. They are added to activities at the same time as regular participants. Their inclusion must be justified and rationalised in the activity summary. For example, you need to explain why you need the number of uh, accompanying persons you're requesting and also what they'll be doing and why they're coming for the duration requested. Accompanying persons are not mandatory, however, failure to address safeguarding for younger groups may affect the assessment of your application. Additionally, projects that include under 18s must have safeguarding processes. 
uh, included in the application, which would be expected to include accompanying persons. Mobilities of under 18s without safeguarding measures included could be deemed ineligible. Next up is the identification of partner organisations. <clears throat> so the query we get is do all partner organisations need to be identified at the time of application? Uh, no, they don't. Uh, it is only advised that you have your host partners in place as early as possible. However, however this is not compulsory as per the programme guide. Please note, however, that one of the qualitative criteria used to assess your application is that the application clearly demonstrates participating UK organisation is already working with international partners or looking to start international relationships with suitable project partners. Therefore, having some or all of your host partners selected at application stage will strengthen your application. Moving on to the next three. So next up, uh, we've had a lot of questions relating to consortiums. Um, so to address the first common query we get about them, uh, each unique consortium is allowed to submit a single application. Any organisation within the consortium may also submit an individual application separately. They must consist of at least two organisations, one of which must be either a school or college that delivers FE and VET. And these schools or colleges must be officially registered or recognised within the UK constituent country which they are based. There is no specific eligibility placed on the applicant or organisation so long as they're working with a school or college. This being said, they would still be subject to financial capacity checks. Next, we have reciprocal visits. Um, the uh, FE and vet, sec uh, the vet sector has never be previously been reciprocal as it was workplace orientated. It was just outbound only. However, under the Turing scheme, study visits are now permitted, meaning that reciprocal exchanges are now more feasible. Inbound mobilities, however, to the UK are not funded under this programme. Um, but if you have arrangements with any partners to run reciprocal visits funded from other sources, please include this in your application as it do a great deal to strengthen the qualitative assessment. Even if you have no firm plans at application stage, if it is your intention to try and run reciprocal visits, please include this in the application. Now, finally, on the FAQs, we have COVID-19. So, as you can imagine, we've had a lot of queries relating to this subject. Um, so currently, the situation is stabilised in the UK, but there's no guarantee that this will remain the case. And the situation on the continent and in certain regions around the world is not good. Um, so the delivery partner is aware of this, but so should applicants. Um, projects should be planned taking this into account. All Turing scheme project activities must take place within the 21-22 academic year. Um, so therefore it's not possible to extend projects under the Turing scheme um, and any unspent monies at the end of the project would have to be returned. Um, all applicants should also get insurance to cover their projects, um, but also in the event of a COVID-19 related incident um, that causes project activities to be cancelled and refunds on money spent can't be um, secured, then we'll, there will be a force majeure element within the contract that you sign with the delivery partner, which means you'll be able to claim the funding regardless of the activity taking place. Um, for these cases, evidence of expenditure would be required, so um, do keep accurate financial records. So that covers the frequently asked questions at the moment, but if you have any other questions, please enter them in the chat or wait for the Q&A session at the end of today and we'll be happy to get an answer to you. So I'll now hand over to my colleague Olivia, who will start taking us through the first two sections of the award criteria. Hi everyone. Um, so each application is scored out of a total of 100 points and is split across the various award criteria. Each criterion relates to one or more of the programme objectives and each qualitative section of the application form is split into these criteria. International engagement focuses on the objective of a global Britain and is given a maximum of 20 points. 
Widening participation relates to the levelling up objective and can earn the application up to 30 points. Driving positive impact and value for money relate to the developing skills and value for UK taxpayer objectives and can again score a maximum of 30 points. Whilst design and implementation of the project can touch on all objectives and is given a maximum of 20 points. Assessors will apply principles around proportionality and assess the qualitative elements of the application in relation to the size and profile of the applicant and budget numbers requested. In order to be considered for funding, all applications should meet a minimum quality threshold. Assessors must make a judgment on the extent to which applications meet during a scheme programme guide defined criteria and this judgment must be based on the information provided in the application form. Anything that's not included in the application cannot be assumed if it's not explicitly provided, so please include anything you think will provide clarity and strengthen the application. Assessors are aware that although the award criteria has been split into the various sections of the form, information relevant for a specific criterion may appear in different parts of the application and assessors must take all information into account when scoring. The type of projects, its complexity, the scale of its activities, the applicant's experience and capacity and the size of the grant requested will be considered when an analysing applications. We'll now move on to the specific award criteria. So first up is the Global Britain objective, which is mostly touched upon in the international engagement section of the application form. In line with the UK government's vision of a Global Britain, Turing scheme projects should support high quality placements, enhance existing partnerships and encourage the forging of new relationships across the world. The first criteria the assessor will be looking at is the extent to which the project demonstrates the organisations involved are suitable and demonstrates the strengthening of UK international relations. The application should clearly demonstrate that the participating UK organisation is already working with international partners or looking to start international relationships with suitable project partners. Here include as much detail as possible about already formed international partnerships, how you chose particular partners and what you're work working towards together to achieve. You must be able to link your joint objectives to those of the Turing scheme. If you've not yet formed international partnerships, then please detail the steps you plan in order to gain long lasting and beneficial relationships abroad. For example, will you sign up to an appropriate partner finding tool or could anyone within your network of peers facilitate the finding of a partner? The application should demonstrate how the organisation will develop or strengthen their ability to successfully cooperate with international partners in the relevant educational sector. For example, we will ensure one member of staff is fully committed to managing this relationship and being a first point of contact, or can successful international partnerships be something which is written into organisation or team-wide objectives. The application should also demonstrate clear benefits of the UK organisation working with the proposed international partners with clear reasoning for the countries involved. What are you hoping to achieve with your partner and how will it have a positive impact on all involved in the partnership? The proposed activities should have greater potential value than similar training offered in the UK and should contribute to increasing the international dimension of your organisation. The assessor will also want the application to make clear the extent to which the application demonstrates the quality of cooperation and communication strategies between the participating organisations. The proposal must show that the distribution of responsibilities and tasks of all participating organisations is balanced with a focus on quality. Think about each organisation's strengths and expertise. Who will be responsible for what and why? For example, does one of your partner's strengths lie in the field of marketing and would it be a good idea to task them with the in-depth dissemination of project results? The proposal must show that appropriate cooperation arrangements are established between the participating organisations and it must indicate appropriate channels for com communication. You need to ensure you've thought about methods and frequency of communication here as good communication is essential for a successful international partnership. For example, will you have monthly project planning meetings within your own organisation, which you can also invite partners to virtually? 
You may wish to draw up an agreement with partners prior to the start of the project, which would ensure certain communications or responsibilities are adhered to, such as receiving email updates from all partners on certain topics at specific points in the project duration. We'll now move on to levelling up. So this objective of the programme will mostly be touched upon in the widening participation section of the application form. Turing scheme projects will support social mobility and widen participation across the UK. They should help promote equal access and opportunities to all pupils, students and learners, regardless of their background. Widening access to disadvantaged groups is a focus of the Turing scheme and a lot of importance should be placed on this within your application form. The assessor will firstly be looking at the extent to which the project is reaching out to target groups with fewer opportunities and additional educational needs. The application should include target groups with less access to opportunities or additional ed educational needs. This could include participants with an annual household income of 25,000 or less who are receiving universal credit or income related benefits, learners in care or who are care experienced, participants who have caring responsibilities, refugees and asylum seekers and learners in receipt of free, free meals. A full list is available in Annex A of the Turing Scheme Programme Guide. The application should provide clear and concise information on the target groups it intends to work with, identifying any challenges to participation and appropriate measures to overcome them. Will you provide extra support to your target groups and if so, what form will this take? The assessor will also be looking at the appropriateness of measures for selecting and or involving part <coughs> participants in the mobility activities. The application should demonstrate a clear and transparent selection process of participants and include provision for learners with fewer opportunities and additional educational needs. What will your selection process look like? Will you require letters of motivation, application forms or set up tasks to complete? How will you include provisions? For example, will you provide expenses for anyone from a low income background to be able to participate in an assessment day or to an att attend an interview? Or will you allow additional time for anyone with caring responsibilities to apply? Or will a member of staff be able to support the understanding of a learner with additional educational needs? The criteria for selecting individuals must be fair and transparent and allow selection of individuals for whom the project aims to address and with a high potential of achieving the intended learning outcomes. Will the selection process involve completion of an application form or interview, for example, and will this be split into sections which address various criteria? How will you select who participates, who will gain the most from the experience and who is the most appropriate participant in terms of your project goals and objectives? Also think about ways to ensure withdrawals are avoided at a later stage by putting in thorough selection criteria. The final award criteria will be the appropriateness of measures for supporting learners with fewer opportunities or additional educational needs. The application must demonstrate a clear approach to supporting participants with additional educational needs, for example, ensuring that suitable host venues and accommodation are provided. If your project involves any SEND students, remember that you can undertake a pre-mobility visit to the host organisations to carry out a risk assessment. You may also want to consider whether some participants will require one-to-one -one support and how this will work throughout the project's duration. The application must consider the needs of learners with fewer opportunities. It's likely that participants who fall in this category will not be able to afford things like passports, visas, appropriate clothing, luggage and cultural or language preparation, amongst other things. So this needs to be accounted for within the narrative of your application, as well as the exceptional costs category of the budget section. I'll now hand back over to Dan to discuss the remainder of the award criteria. Thank you, Olivia. So we will move on to the next award criteria four, which is developing key skills. Um, and that's covered through driving positive impact and value for money. So this would mean that these projects should offer unique career building opportunities uh, and that they give participants the hard and soft skills sought by employers and bridge the gap between education and work. 
So as well as developing key skills, it would also be scored together with value for UK taxpayers, which would mean these projects optimise social value in terms of potential costs, benefits and risks. So now I'll work our way through um, the different elements of this criteria. So we'll start off the first one, which would be the relevance of the project and organisation's policy principles of the Turing scheme. So this would be interpreted as the application is clearly relevant to Turing scheme policy priorities, which again are Global Britain levelling up, developing key skills and value for UK taxpayers. Um, the application also needs to clearly fall within the scope of the educational sector, as well as addressing appropriate target groups. Um, these sector priority areas need to be identified within the application. For example, the UK government and the devolved administrations set out educational priority areas routinely, so you'd have to explain how your project links to these areas. <clears throat> Next part of the criteria, um, the extent of project objectives are verifiable and measurable. <clears throat> so this needs to cover things such as the application should be clearly stating how the project objectives will be verified and measured and in what form this will take. Um, so for this, you'd need to outline the methods you'd be, use, uh, be using to assess whether the project has met its objectives or not. Uh, and then the timeframes for that as well. Um, the application also needs to clearly demonstrate how objectives will be achieved across the entire project life cycle from its beginning uh, to during the activities and then after the project funding has ended through its dissemination and follow up. Uh, and then how the proposed activities are appropriate for achieving the project objectives and how these will have a positive impact. Um, because of participating in the Turing scheme. For example, if your objective is to improve learning attainment for a certain cohort of learners taking part in the project, then activities that are not academically based may not be appropriate. So continuing on the same criteria, <clears throat> the next element is the suitability of the project to the needs of individual participants. So for this criteria, you'd need to cover uh, the following elements. Um, the application would need to outline what type of participants are expected to be involved in the mobility project. Here you need to include their subject area, vocational field and background, um, whether they're disadvantaged or not. The application needs to identify and address uh, uh, specific needs of all participants, um, for example, their education attainment, social mobility or employment prospects. The participant needs are placed at the centre of the application um, and consider, uh, consideration is given on the likely impact of their participation. The proposed activities are appropriate to address the identified needs of the participants involved in the project, for example, you would just need to explain how the activities you carry out on your projects would help you meet the needs of the participants, such as workplace experience, equipping participants that need help in improving employment prospects um, with the necessary experience. The expected project outputs and learning outcomes of the participants are clearly explained and in line with the identified needs of the learners, which you would have previously entered and then that the application shows that the learning outcomes of our participants will be appropriately recognised or validated. So for example, if your participants are given a certificate for completion or the completion of the placement contributes um, to their enrolled course. Still with driving positive impact here, there's quite a few elements of this criteria. So the next part of this one is the quality of measures for evaluating uh, the potential impact of the project on participants and participant organisations during and after the project. Sorry, being interrupted here. <laughs> one sec. Mm -hmm. Sorry guys, you just bear with us one sec.
Right, sorry about that. Um, hazards of working from home. Um, right, I think I'll start this slide again because I've lost my train of thought. So, yeah. So, this element of the criteria. The quality of measures for evaluating the potential impacts of the project on participants and participating organisations during and after the project lifetime. So for this criteria, you'll need to outline your methods for evaluation uh, of the impact of the project. Um, provide information on how the project is likely to have a substantial positive impact on the participating organisations and participants. Um, examples could include improved knowledge, newly acquired or developed skills and changes in attitude or behaviour. Um, these outcomes may have a further impact on the employment status, role delivery, ability to access further education, well-being or life cycle. Um, and then also the organisational impacts. These could include things such as Ofsted results, examination results, learn retention or reputational improvement. <clears throat> so moving on to the next criteria, the proposal describes the measures that would be taken to ensure lasting effects of the project, including after the end of the project uh, and how you engage with participants uh, once they've finished their involvement in the project. And then you'd also need to explain how you utilise positive results of your project. Um, for example, how they would be used in um, further activities you may run or the dissemination activities or promotion of your organisation. Next, uh, the project is likely to have projects likely to benefit benefit individuals and organisations other than those directly participating uh, in the project. Um, how will the project affect the wider local community? Will it impact students who didn't take part? Could it have a regional or national impact or could it have an international impact? And the final area of this award criteria, which is the project provides good value for money. So in this uh, area, you need to cover whether the proposed activities are new or additional to existing practices within the sending organisation. Uh, this means that the project would not just fund an ongoing activity run by the applicant, um, which is funded from non-grant sources. If an organisation already runs similar activities, how does maturing funding add to this? So for that one, that would apply if you do run similar activities from non-grant funding sources. Um, what is the added value? of um, receiving the Turing funding and why that differ from your existing activities. And then the application needs to provide clear evidence of the benefit of the funding to the applicant organisation and to the participant. For example, if applicants are expected to pay for their particip participation, where is the value of the grant money? So we'll now move on to the final award criteria, which is design and implementation. So this relates to the management of your project primarily. So we'll run through the uh, areas for this criteria. The first one being the quality of practical arrangements, management and support modalities. So under this, you'd need to cover how the application demonstrates that efficient measures are put in place and appropriate resources allocated by the participating organisations to ensure high quality mobility activities. This relates to your organisation's own internal project management methods and, and whether they or the amount of resources given to the project are appropriate to its scale. Um, the application would also need to demonstrate appropriate support measures are in place support learners with fewer opportunities or additional educational needs. For example, if participants are going on six month long placements, how will you as the sending organisation support them? Will there be staff drop in sessions or dedicated support staff at the host organisation? 
um, will you have virtual catch ups and how would any reporting mechanism for issues work? And then if applicable, the role and added value of the Project UK Consortium is clearly described and relevant. Coordinating organisations must explain their role, obligations and relationship with the organisation sending pupils in the application form. Essentially, this means why are you applying as a consortium? Um, a lot of the time this will refer to organisations that don't have direct access to learners working with schools and colleges and you'd need to justify why working as a consortium is better than the school or college applying directly on their own. Um, for example, this could include things such as organisational capacity, um, improving the scope and scale of the project and covering a larger geographical area of the UK. So the next element of design and implementation uh, is the quality of the preparation provided to international participants. Uh, just one area of this one, which is the application shows that participants receive good quality preparation before the mobility activity, including linguistic, cultural, uh, educational, technical preparation as necessary. So for this, you just need to outline everything you plan to do to prepare the participant for taking part in their mobility. So obviously language support helps them uh, when they're going to a country where they don't speak the language. Um, cultural uh, information, teaching would help them settle in, especially for longer term placements. Uh, and then obviously briefing them on the actual objectives of what they're meant to be doing over there also assists. Next area, um, a commitment to continuous improvement in project delivery and quality of placement. Um, so this needs to, you would need to outline um, how you would improve the quality of your projects, especially during a project life cycle. So for example, how you utilize things such as participant feedback, uh, you'd need to say how would you, you would capture that information and then how you would implement any changes that are required to the structure of your activities. So moving on to the final area of this award criteria. Um, so this is the clarity, completeness and quality of all the project plan. So this would need so applications need to show that all the project flows have been properly designed to ensure that the project will realise its objectives. The application needs to demonstrate a logical approach to project planning and provides clear justification for placement duration, including time and post placement activities. So, for example, if you were to put all of your activities with hundreds of students all starting in one month, um, without sufficient justification, this could reflect negatively on your assessment. Um, so there would need to be, as it says, logical um, justification for the timing of the activities that you'll be uh, delivering as part of your project. The project activities are clearly defined, they're comprehensive and realistic. Um, the project plan contains a clear and well-planned timetable. Um, the, proposal, uh, the proposal foresees a clear method and regular and concrete activities to monitor progress and address any problems encountered. Uh, support and monitoring activities appropriate for target group and placement duration. So these sort of tie into a lot of the other areas of this um, assessment criteria and it essentially boils down to the uh, project management methods and techniques that you'll be implementing and how you so you need to be clear on those areas when you're completing your application. So this brings us to the end of the assessment criteria. So pretty much on schedule, 35 minutes past. So we've now got around 25 minutes of an open forum Q&A session for everybody. So you can 
see if there hasn't been any questions during the uh Wait to see if any come in. I'm wrong. <laughs> there has been questions. Just scrolling through. I'm seeing one. Sorry, no, I think they've all been answered, or I'm in process of being answered. Okay, so I've just had one come in from Richard. So that is not sure whether I missed this, but what determines eligibility of foreign partner in their area, and how many UK and foreign partners can you have? So I'm just going to stop presenting the camera. Hello again. Um, yep, yeah, so the eligibility for overseas partners um, is outlined in the programme guide. So <clears throat> it covers um, essentially what they need to be. So it's essentially just, you know, in a nutshell, uh, they need to be involved in VET or FE. Um, need to log back onto the programme guide to remind myself of full details. So that's where you can find it. But for the second part of your question, is there anything? Uh, sorry, is so the questions are moving as new ones are coming in. <laughs> is that gone? Um, but it related to number of partners. So there's no limit to the number of partners, both UK and abroad, in a project. Uh, I can uh, see one from Karen, um, which is if we cannot deliver the programme due to COVID at the end of the year, do we have to pay back the fee awarded for each participant? So the way that this programme works is that you're paid um, when the money is required, so um, slightly before uh, a placement is due to take place. So there won't necessarily be be much funding paid in advance to pay back so it works um, slightly differently on this program so that shouldn't be the case that there would be any recovery of funds thank you olivia so next one up uh, to clarify did you say level three plus students must apply for HG strength that's correct so anything above level three on the NQF and the UK uh, is considered as HE and would therefore need to apply for the HE stream of funding uh, next one does Turing program recognize ECVET accreditation for ECVET courses developed under previous cooperation so the Turing scheme itself doesn't recognize you know, we're not in the business of recognising qualifications. Um, it's up to you to explain how any qualifications or validation of learning outcomes and a project would benefit the participant. So if you adequately explain why a participant would benefit from the uh, from ECVET in your project, then that would be fine to include. Um, there's one from Andrew about the time limit for final reports and um, you're encouraged to submit a final report within one month of the final mobility activity. Uh, so that should answer that one. So next one, any, so what's the percentage of any WP students? WP? Sorry, I'm not sure what that acronym standing for. Olivia, I don't know if you can. Uh, okay, it's from Anonymous. So if you could just pop in what's meant by WP students. Uh, we'll answer that one in due time. Right. Uh, 
So next, what are there any restrictions to the number of participants in any one mobility and can they be from a range of consortium partners? Uh, that's yes and yes. So no restrictions on the number of participants and you can have multiple participants from different sending organisations in one activity. Um, in act, so an activity can contain uh, numerous uh, sort of flows of participants. So they're sort of defined on their subject area primarily. So you know you couldn't be mixing say English students and math students on a month, uh, study visit because they do different subjects. But an activity can contain two different flows for English students and math students, for example. Uh, does the organisation receive the funds in order to pay for the host activities, i.e. Yeah, um, so those sort of fees, accommodation activities, food is covered through cost of living budget and also organisational support budget when necessary. So yeah, let's see us to that one. So another one from Karen uh, mentioned reciprocal visits. Does that mean we can host incoming Erasmus Fund students? No. Um, so it was mentioned with a specific uh, note that it does not fund incoming visits. But it is an important point that whilst obviously uh, this program is only funding students outbound, um, many countries around the world have their own national programs. So those programs are being used to fund visits to the UK, um, those are definitely worth including in your application form uh, as it strengthens the application, especially its international engagement um, in, the, uh, in international engagement. So even if you don't have firm plans at the time of application, if it's your intention to try and arrange reciprocal visits for a, through other sources of funding, um, we'd very much encourage you to include those plans in the application form. There's one about organisational support. So just to clarify that under each project, £315 will be provided per participant up until 100 participants. And from the 101st onwards, it's £180 per participant. That's the same question. OK, so. Uh, just uh, any new questions, it does help when you pop your names in. <laughs> this one's just from I. Um, not sure of uh, clarification level yet. If a student is studying at level three but not yet achieved, are they el eligible under the FE? Yeah, so level three is FE. So it's anything above level three, um, just in that sort of area. If they're level four and haven't completed it, they're still level four, so I'd need to apply via the HE strand of funding. Okay. Right, so one's from Dave Entwistle. Can you comment on differences between placements which would have been previously defined as volunteer placements in European Solidarity Corps? Um, those had a focus on developing soft and professional skills with partner organisations and a vet placement based on an NGO which seemed to operate on a similar funding budget. I'm aware of different eligibility of organisations, although there seems to be a lot of close potential parallels in what placement activity might. So the primary difference is um, FE and VET directly relates, relates to a course. Sorry, did someone just get a bit of that? Yeah, sorry, the comment disappeared just now. Um, yeah, OK, Carrot. yeah, so the primary difference between FE and VET and what was uh, the Solidarity Corps is that the activities directly relate to a course so 
um, whereas ESC activities tend to be quite general. Um, obviously, they did develop, so as you're saying, like soft skills, um, some of areas like that. But um, its value of sending, you know, uh, a learner who's enrolled on a course or just graduated from a course, um, that's the primary difference. I mean, study visits would obviously involve direct learning and then uh, work placements would primarily relate to that. And that's obviously working in within your vocational area. So the activities taking place uh, is covered in the award criteria. They do need to be relevant and appropriate to what the learners needs are. So, for example, someone's on a vocational course like um, electrical engineering, the activity that they're taking part in has to be related to electrical engineering. Otherwise, there's no value relating to their needs as a learner. Um, things like soft skills are included uh, in this sector. However, they sort of play not a significance, as big a significance, sorry, as um, their educational needs. Um, and again, it's also relating to the um, eligibility criteria of learners. So they need to be enrolled or just graduated from these courses, whereas under ESC, those weren't the requirements. Um, I hope that answers that one. If you've got anything else, just feel free to pop another follow up question in. OK, so another one relating to funding. So the question is, in terms of monies, do colleges participants cover the upfront costs and then claim back the insuring? Unsure the timeline of monies, if you say monies would be not be front loaded in product. So there will be, it's just a different time scale of when those payments are made. So under previous funding programmes, it was an initial payment of a certain percentage of the total grant awarded. Whereas under Turing scheme, money will be paid in advance of activities. It's just the payment request has to be uh, submitted at an appropriate time before the activity is taking place. So for example, you can, in your application form, you can request uh, payments uh, between one and three months before the activity takes place. Um, whereas previously you could get 100% of the funding for an activity like 18 months before it took place, um, which is why that decision, uh, that method's changed. The only exception to that is your organisational support budget. So this can be uh, requested at the beginning of the project. Um, I believe one to three months before any activities start, so obviously because organisational support covers much more sort of like essential areas for project delivery, like sort of staff wages, um, equipment, other things like that, administration costs. So there's two different time scales for organisational support and then activity related budgets. Um, yeah, so there's a section in the programme guide that covers the new um, payment mechanisms, so I'd advise that you give that a read. Okay. Uh, there's one from Stuart. Are people eligible to participate if they have just completed a level three course at an FE college? Uh, that's a yes. So um, a recent graduate of an FE or VET course, um, which means within 12 months is eligible to participate. Um, so from Andrew, can there be changes to consortium partners should a partner be unable to participate? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I want to say no, but I'd need to sort of research to confirm that answer. Uh, Mike, I don't know if you've got any clarity on that. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, yes, there is uh, an option okay. uh, as there is uh, with Erasmus Plus uh, and other uh, funding schemes. If your partner can't take, take part for any reason, then obviously we're in a, a very strange um, uh, position with COVID-19 and the uh, restrictions on international travel. So it might be the application that you put in and the consortium partners or uh, uh, international partners that you put into the application may need to change whatever reason, just as long as the application doesn't go significantly away from the original application that you submitted. So the themes, the 
uh, objectives of the application are consistent, uh, any consortium or international partner changes would be permitted just through a, uh, an amendment to the contract. That's mine. Um, so one from Bali Sapal. When you mean outbound, you mean from the UK? Yeah, so outbound means travel from the UK to anywhere else in the world. There's a question about placements outside of Europe, um, e.g. America, Canada. Yeah, that's eligible. Uh, another one from Bali. Uh, students own, can students only be from the UK? So um, in terms of residents, yes, they must be resident in the UK, but their nationality doesn't need to be uh, British. They can be a uh, resident of the UK, but any nationality and they can, so long as they meet the eligibility criteria and programme guide, they'd be eligible to take part. So another one from Karen, um, for organisation organization support, where the college employs someone dedicated to run this project and pay them accordingly, to recruit liaise with partners, etc. We cannot proceed, uh, do we as a college have to recover that cost? Um, so, set, so you can request the organisational support budget from the beginning of the project. So uh, I believe the earliest it can be paid is August, um, 20 this year obviously 2021 um but yeah i mean any expenses prior to that wouldn't be covered by funding by the Trum program i mean wouldn't expect any costs have been incurred at that stage anyway okay so from Matilia, we work with a lot of neat young people so not education, employment and training for those not familiar with the acronym uh, and run employability projects but they're not government funded projects. Um, so it, they still have to fall into the criteria set out in programme guides so they'd need to either be enrolled on relevant courses, um, recent graduates or in government funded training. Unfortunately, uh, Okay. Uh, if the project lasts for two weeks, can there be two different groups of company persons go for a week each uh, and are they all funded for travelling in this case? Um, so yeah, this can be uh, configured in the application form. You just need to provide um, the appropriate justification for that expense. Um, so you just need to state why uh, they'd only be able to stay for one week rather than two. So no so for example, at a college, it might be a lot harder to get staff time off uh, for two weeks. So I know that's common practice, but yeah, um, in the activity summary, uh, you just need to provide the appropriate uh, justification for that request and then that would be assessed um, by the delivery partners at uh, the assessment stage. Somebody's asked uh, whether accommodation costs are within the cost of living budget line, which is a yes. It's anything while uh, the participants are out there, really. So out of a total 110 million of funding available, how much is funding allocated to FE and VET projects? That is 35 million pounds. So, uh, apologies if I mispronounce this. Um, uh, Prakriti, sorry. Um, what is the percentage of any of students from disadvantaged backgrounds um, with the Turing scheme be looking at in the application? So there's no percentage, um, there's no quotas. It's just um, an assessment 
uh, criteria does benefit projects that work with disadvantaged people. So it could be one out of 10, it could be 10 out of 10. Um, it's entirely up to you in the narrative to sort of like hit that award criteria, but there's no specific numbers or anything. Um, can travel and medical insurance be paid with the funding? Uh, yes, obviously there's a dedicated travel budget. Uh, medical insurance, I believe, <clears throat> directly paid for only for SEND and disadvantaged participants. Um, however, for students who don't, I mean, learners, participants that don't fall into those categories, it could be paid for out of the organisational support budget. So from Amy, uh, not sure you answered this already, just wondering what's the age limit? Would postgraduate students be able to take part? Um, so there's no age limit, um, but I don't know. I, I associate postgraduate people who just graduated from university, so obviously they wouldn't be eligible unless enrolled onto a VET or FE course. Um, but yeah. There's plenty of like age range within the FE and VET sectors, so there's no age limits on uh, participants. Uh, are mandates required for UK consortium or host partners? Uh, no, they're not required. Um, it's just advised that people do have established agreements between different port partner organisations, um, especially when there's any transferring of funds going on. Uh, students at level one and two can be participants too. Um, I need to double check the NQF, but if that falls into FE and vocational education training, then yes, I would be. Um, yeah, uh, good question. I think uh, the only thing we can just think of in that one is obviously we have the schools stream of funding as well. So obviously there are school qualifications that would fall into that category. Um, so if they're eligible for the school's stream of funding, they'd have to apply through that. Uh, just another one from Dave. Uh, that's a really great answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, am I right in understanding from your answer that there must be, should be, a direct link between a participant's course uh, or study and their specific Turing vet place? Yes, uh, there must be. Um, as I so the example I gave was electrical engineering student must be doing something, either study or traineeship that is directly related to uh, electrical engineering and that example can be applied for any course area. Um, so yeah, so uh, if that participant isn't uh, on or graduated from uh, the subject area of the activity, uh, you know, contents, then they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be an eligible participant. Um, it's not something you have to demonstrate up front. It's just something that we would check in like uh, the event of an audit in the organisation, we asked for enrolment uh, or proof of graduation for graduates. Hope that helps. Uh, Karen, can we still go to Europe or is a bid stronger? No, no strength for any region of the world and you can still go to Europe. Um, yeah, any, anywhere. So there's no country specific restrictions. It's just like the um, Foreign Office travel advice has to be adhered to. So, for example, if the Foreign Office says you can't travel to this country for whatever reason, you can't go there. Um, and that advice is up to you to follow, but obviously there'll be some cases where it's abundantly clear you can't go somewhere. But no, there's no restrictions in the scheme for where you can go. 
can overseas host partners be added after application has gone in? Um, they can. Um, you just need to be aware that your budget um, will have already been formed. So if you change the host to someone who's in a much more expensive country, you wouldn't be able to get more funding. So again, travel insurance, like medical insurance, uh, it could be claimed for participants uh, who are SEND or from a disadvantaged background. Otherwise, your organisation have to cover it or could be paid for from your organisational support. Um, Amy has asked about postgraduate degrees like masters or PGCEs, and that would be higher education rather than further education or VET. Uh, are there any plans to link with Erasmus Plus? Uh, this would hugely increase opportunity for scope or uh, well, Erasmus Plus has finished this year and the successor programme, no details. And also we just won't have any details or anything like that at a webinar like this, so can't provide you with an answer, unfortunately. Uh, so looks like the final one. Um, and yes, this is the last one and I think we won't take any more questions. It's just seeing the time of the one minute past 12. So are IQ fitness diploma and sports students eligible for their applications? Um, yes. So so long as you can outline how a qualification is recognised um, and what the value contributing to that qualification would be for the participant, um, it can be used, uh, used in the maturing scheme. So yeah, um, I think there's like one question that we'll have to send an answer to afterwards, but other than that, it looks like everything's been covered. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for that stream of questions. It's always good to see, you know, a large degree of engagement from everybody. Um, yeah, so it's, if there's anything you still would like to ask us, uh, you can email us at Turing dash scheme at chorus.com anytime. Um, we'll respond to any emails within five working days, but we aim to do it a lot quicker than that. Um, and yeah, no question too big, no small on our helpline. So yeah, if in doubt, just let us know. Um, then we also have our online resources available. So the program guide is the main document, which is rules of a program so always consult there first but in addition to that we also have a guide for applicants um, which is a bit more relevant to what we've covered today that goes into the qualitative assessment areas more um, it provides sort of examples explanations for each question that's on the application form and then we have a webinar about application support as well which is a run through of the application form itself on the website. So yeah, so thanks everybody for attending. Um, that's everything done for today and good luck on all your applications.